So we're going to talk a lot about some sharp stuff today and how we can augment um, rosacea and facial telangiectasia because the two are not, uh, you know, you can see one in a setting and one in another setting um, using all those great, all the great information you've heard today. So in our office, we, we see a lot of vascular lesions. I just didn't realize how much until you start thinking about every day what the consults are coming in. Um, and being a, a sort of a tertiary laser center, we will see a lot of these, a lot of red and a lot of brown. I tell our, our, our staff and our uh, the dermatologists, that's what we're gonna see. And we just have to get good at treating them. Um, medications are always the first line for us. Um, whatever we can do medically is important. Um, but these, you know, facial telangiectasia, rosacea, scars, we could, we could talk about all these things. Maybe we will next time. But a lot of these nuances we can, you can attack with the, with the knives that I want to show you today. But this patient actually taught me a lot. This was within the past couple of months. She came back after two years. I've not seen her. Two years has gone by. Why? Because we actually medically did really well in her rosacea. I mean, she's got some pretty good results. You can see on your, let's see. So on your left, uh, the, the papular pustular, uh, you know, kind of uh, really severe inflammation of central facial and central facial distribution with the rosacea. She came back two years later and all that was gone and she was on medical therapy and doing real well. And look what was left, just the redness. And if you, if, I don't know if it projects, but you can see telangiectasia. So now she wants to treat that. And so we can go forward, but I thought this is a really representative of what you might see if you switch and maybe just only use medical, you might be left with something that uh, you can help with devices, and that's what we'll talk about. Um, this survey that was, that was done uh, by a laser company and looking uh, just about uh, attitudes and behavior towards laser treatment for rosacea just gave some rough numbers that you've probably already seen today. 16 million people in the U.S. suffer with rosacea, and six out of 10 people consider it to be bothersome and uh, extremely bothersome. And then seven out of 10 uh, have been suffering this for for several years before they actually seek help. A lot of these people had no idea that device or laser therapy was an option. Um, and I still believe that some, the ones that do are referrals from other dermatologists, but a lot of people don't. And so we have to sort of talk them through the options and what we can do to treat their facial redness because it, it, is, it is different. It's flushing, it's telangiectasia, it's persistent facial redness. How can we improve all these things? So we, we talk about we're going to talk a little bit about telangiectasia first, because in the aging face, you're going to see telangiectasia as part of the aging of the dermis. The dermis gets thinner, we change the dermal constituents, um, we lose collagen, we lose elastin, and the blood vessels become more noticeable. They become more prone to weaken walls and rupture and ecta ectasia, as we call it. And so that just promotes their visibility. Um, the collagen loss we all know about, we've talked about with, uh, with what Sunil mentioned that can make actually the acne scars look even worse if you start uh, overlaying lax skin on top of that. Um, but the elastin fibers as well, which is something that as of now we can't really replace as well as we can volume with fillers, for example, hyaluronic acid. Uh, hopefully we will get there. But during the aging process, these round, nice vessels become more ectatic, they become more ovaloid, and they become more visible. And so we, you know, we get complaints about this. Uh, but the dermal vasculature, the dermal vas vascular plexus is really, really pronounced. I mean, you go from these big name vessels that we're worried about hitting and worried about uh, being, you know, with fillers and we're worried about with most surgery about avoiding these things if at all possible or tying them off to these fine, fine vessels in the dermal plexus that have that ability to vasodilate and really give us the red face. So how do we control these? Because the problem is they're all different sizes. And so when you're doing device, the size matters when it comes to the device, the, the, the vasculature, and what you're treating. Let's go back embryonically. And I, I noticed this a couple years ago, and you may have, who all treats um, blood vessels in the office, in the audience here? Do you treat them with lasers or? Okay, so some lasers out there. I noticed, started noticing patterns in people that come in, and I went back and looked in the literature, and there actually are patterns that are embryonically based. So. We're going to go through some clinical examples, but these subdermal plexuses are, I call them sort of watershed areas that you'll see patients with that are more resistant to treatment just because I think there's more flow in these areas. So we'll step through some of these, and these can explain some things that you might see. These central facial, so in cross polarization, it's not just a vessel, these are all a highly complex interlex, uh, inter, uh, interlocking network of vessels, and they have a, and that increases their flow, so they become a little harder to treat. Um, 
Here's the tra treatment immediately after. Uh, and you can see that we've been very successful in shutting down these vessels. This was uh, with the, I think with the 532 nanometer laser. Uh, and actually in some areas you can see where we overtreated because there's a little bit of redness where the blood sort of leaked out and you're gonna probably, you might even have some purpura there. Another example based on that sort of embryonically similar on the, out on the preauricular area, this is the mid face. Again, you can see much better with cross polarization as they treated. And sometimes I'll use this to actually guide where we're going to treat our, do our settings. And this person more, more preauricular, think about that diagram. You see the vessels here are all different sizes, but they're very large. And so you would need something with a larger spot and a larger pulse width to get to these. But these are patterns that you can recognize. This actually pattern is, is difficult to treat as well. What about around the nose in, the, um, in, in this area, in the alar, alar crease, the ala itself, when you get some feeding from the superior labial artery and the facial artery, you get these high flows. Embryonically, this is sort of a high, fusion, a high, high flow area. And these are some of the hardest patients that I had to treat. Now, these patients can have rosacea. Rosacea can definitely present with only an erythematous or intensely erythematous nose with papules. I find those very hard to control the redness. Um, and here's another, another example showing more on the Collier-Meller side where you have this kind of watershed area with these increased density of vessels um, and, and background erythema. So this guy was a, was a judge in our, uh, and he came in and he just wanted these treated and I just, I had a very difficult time controlling his background erythema. I, you know, I even resorted to doing uh, micro Botox and some other things or botulinum toxin um, and still had a difficult time. We were able to get a telangiectasis, but not as erythema. Another watershed area might be around the chin. Here you have off the inferior labial artery and um, some of the watershed. You can see those vessels. Those are pretty big vessels. We would target with 20 milliseconds or higher, and then smaller ones we might do six or three milliseconds or uh, use a pulse light device, as we'll talk about. Uh, and so these, are, and these, are, uh, these can be in rosacea patients, so they may not be. We talk about the wavelengths that we treat uh, with rosacea, the, uh, the ones that are commonly used, um, PDL or 595, these go interchangeably, pulse dial laser, uh, the 532, which is also known as the frequency doubled NDAG, um, 1064 or the NDAG, which I won't talk about as much, um, which can be used. And then we'll talk about pulse light or intense pulse light. Because we really want to get all those vessels in different sizes. So these are the ones that are, are, as I mentioned, that are commonly used. And some of that really depends on what you can tune your fluence to and what you can tune your pulse width to. And in the case of intense pulse light, we can do multiple pulses. So we gradually increase the, the heat being, uh, uh, the, the heat of the vessel, of the target vessel, and try to get it without rupturing to get it to a target temperature where it thermally coagulates. Because what we want to see is this. We want to see the vessels under the skin, photocoagulated, you see that, that, erith that uh, kind of a coagulative necrosis of the vessel and the endothelial cells around the vessel. They're pygnotic, they're they're, they've been damaged by the heat. This vessel will hopefully go away, and this is, could be one of the ones causing that erythema or flushing. And the other thing to notice is the surface of the skin is perfectly intact and the dermis is intact. So we have used selective photothermolysis to coagulate the vessel. That's our goal with all these treatments. But realistically, I mean, you can do this, but what about these smaller vessels? And this is, we'll talk a little bit about combination therapy, not in the sense that Julie talked about it or she was probably going to talk about it. We'll talk about device and drug because I think you can shut down some of these smaller vessels um, with, with, uh, with topicals, even, even, even right after you do the laser treatment. Why is that important? I won't belabor this. She did a great job, of, uh, better than I can, of explaining why we would use a topical um, a topical agent like this, but postsynaptically, you can use these these to shut down the vessel and vasoconstrict, um, and that goes along with what we're trying to do with devices as well. Except we're doing it thermally with devices. Um, the, what we, we we participated in this trial as well, and we we noticed no rebound erythema with topical oxymetazoline, and so we do use this liberally um, in our cosmetic patients, both uh, right after treatment and um, in a series of. Uh, and then we basically just started on it, try to keep them on it for maintenance because, as Julie mentioned, maintenance, I think, is really uh, understated in rosacea. Even, when, even in device treatments, when you get the result you want, it, is, it, is, it needs to be maintained. It's not going to be permanent. 
So what are some of the devices that have been in the literature, uh, pulse dilator, um, and the, some of the newer advances in that, meaning, of course, a bigger spot size. The bigger the spot size, the more photons that will hit your target of interest uh, without scattering and going elsewhere. So in an ideal world, we could have a larger spot size, a decent fluence, and have some flexibility in pulse width and be able to hit these targets more frequently. Uh, there are a couple publications on device treatment in combination with drug we'll talk about. The, the frequency doubled KTP at 532. These are the kind of the, both the Ford and Chevy, the vascular laser world. These are both ones that are really popular. Um, and this one also has an increased spot size. I think it goes up to 15. Uh, the, this wavelength doesn't penetrate as deeply, but can be equally effective for treatment of redness uh, with, uh, with multi-pass techniques and changing pulse widths. Intense pulse light, which I, I use very commonly, and I do all these in my in my office, this is actually the one, if you look under complications with lasers, uh, nationwide, this probably has the most complications of any light-based device, and it's used very frequently for hair removal, which is probably the most common use of lasers, so that might not surprise you, but it's, it's a challenging device to use because you have to be careful with your cooling, you have to be very careful with your technique, and you have to be careful on the patient side that they're not too tan for this device, but using this appropriately, you can get some really great results. There actually are some very interesting articles with the direct effect of intense pulse light on demodex. And there was one that I wanted to show you of a, a, a pulse light treatment of a demodex mite on a slide and watching it sort of shrivel up and stop moving. Uh, but this is the, that thermal heat. You can get up pretty high. You can get up to 45 to 60 degrees transiently, and you can kill these thermally. Uh, and that, and that, that is being used now actually in conjunction with some of the medications Julie mentioned for ocular rosacea. There are a couple studies out now using IPL to treat ocular rosacea by treating and heating the mybobian glands and also depleting the demodex that might be in that area. Microsecond YAG, uh, this is the device that Dr. Chilkari showed you um, for skin of color. Uh, sort of a laser genesis is the term that's been used um, for years now to describe this high rep rate, low energy YAG and its ability to shut down erythema. It uh, has a lot of utility in skin of color, because in skin of color, and, and, and that's one thing we should really talk about in a lecture maybe next year, is how do you identify rosacea in skin of color, because it definitely exists, and it's hard for me to pick up. I have patients that are African American and, for example, Indian that, that have this condition, and how do we treat this? This is one option. And there's also something in the literature about using photodynamic therapy or Levulan or some of these photosensitizing agents, along with red, blue light, IPL, whatever you can throw at it, because this um, drug, not only does it uh, accumulate in the follicles, not only does it accumulate in dyskeratotic and um, dysplastic cells, but it actually also accumulates in the vasculature, um, cutaneous, microcutaneous vasculature. So heating up uh, the vasculature uh, could be even more enhanced by using a photodynamic agent such as Levulan or, or, uh, or uh, amylase, the two, uh, the two ones in the U.S. What about pain control? Has anybody ever been treated by a pulse dial laser? So in the South, we just tend to grin and bear it, but actually it, it hurts. I saw a study where they, you, they did microfocused ultrasound and pulse dial laser and I think IPL and a pin stick, and they asked patients to compare which one hurt the most. And interestingly enough, the pulse dial laser, which I use all the time, was in comparative, comparative to pain to a needle stick, which I thought was, I, I guess I didn't realize it hurt so much, but um, that just tells you, you, you know, you can cause some discomfort in patients, you know, it's that old thing, you, you, you bruise them, you lose them, but if you cause pain to patients, you'll lose them too. And as Sunil said, you wanna keep patients comfortable and keep them in the practice. This was an interesting study that came out last year that talked about how do you control pain in these vascular uh, patients that are treated, uh, receiving vascular treatments. So in our practice, we use topical anesthetic for almost for all IPL treatments. IPL can hurt. I mean, IPL contains infrared wavelengths all the way up to, say, 1,200 nanometers, so it's penetrating deeply. And the more you penetrate, the deeper you penetrate with the laser, the more discomfort you're going to have. So we, we treat them uh, after 30 minutes, or, but the topical either 4% or sometimes 30% lidocaine. In this case, they used um, lidocaine tetracaine, which I think is a really good idea, either 7-7 seven, seven or 15-15. And they, uh, they actually looked at the endpoints of improvement in erythema in patients that had um, 
uh, topical anesthetic in patients that didn't, and they found a non-inferior, they used a non-inferiority index, and they found basically no, much, no, no difference. Has anybody ever put topical anesthesia on a patient and noticed that they get red afterwards? You try to remove it and they get real red. Well, that's always worried me because it, I wonder, are they absorbing more energy? Is it gonna affect the treatment at all? Is it gonna make them, you know, is it gonna increase their risk for potentially getting a burn with, too, with a lot more absorption? They did not encounter this in the study and they, they actually uh, looked at efficacy and said it really wasn't, uh, wasn't much difference. So they concluded that if you can use a topical anesthetic, go ahead and use it for the comfort value, but it's not going to impact the, the results. So what we, we, we are beginning to do more and more, and we've been doing pulse dive for 20 years now, is to maybe put topical on for 20, 30 minutes and make, them, make our patients feel more comfortable. So the larger spot size, as I mentioned, can deliver more photons into a focused area, and so it gives you a better chance of one of those photons hitting the uh, target, in this case, the, uh, oxy, uh, the, the oxyhemoglobin in the vessel. And there's been several studies on that. This was just one done by Eric Bernstein using a 15 millimeter spot and showed a, um, both improvement in investigator rating and subject rating after 12 weeks uh, in comparison to, um, uh, uh, to some of the other publications that have had seven spot and 10 spots. So the offshoot of this is if you can use a larger spot size, use it, especially in your first couple treatments. So what about comparing these studies on head-to-head? -head? There have not been a lot of comparison studies of, say, 530. How do you know which wavelength is better, which one to get? A lot of that I tell patients, uh, I tell uh, physicians and uh, physician extenders that want, want some advice on what to buy is, what does your patient population have? Uh, do you have skin of color? Do you have you know, type 1, type 2, type 3? Do you have a lot of photoaging in addition to rosacea? Do you have a lot of lentiginous change? All that's going to impact what device you buy, because these are, are very expensive devices. This was one particular study that looked at 532 versus 595 in the treatment of facial telangiectasia and redness, and they concluded that they were the same. Again, these studies are not really high, highly powered studies, and the endpoints are typically either global assessment or investigator assessment, and sometimes not blinded, sometimes blinded, and then uh, subject uh, rater assessment. One thing I can tell you, I mean, I, having used both these devices, I, I, I believe the study to be accurate. 532 tends to give you more swelling and tends to give you more, um, uh, it, it's a, it can be a little bit more uncomfortable than, say, IPL for sure, but definitely gives you more swelling uh, post-treatment compared to 595. So all things being equal, you just have to be able to manage these, these things. So we talk to patients about swelling under the eyes. We talk to them about Persistent swelling for a couple of days, panfacial swelling. So if patients have a, if they have a lot of erythema and they're fair skinned, we're going to either send them out uh, with some with a with a prednisone prescription or topical steroid prescription. We're going to ask them to use ice. I'm going to ask them to sleep at a 30 degree angle because I don't want that edema collecting around the in the lower lids, which is the first place it'll go. And we're going to talk to them about potential antihistamines because we want them to. To their downtime to be minimized. But you have to have these discussions because these patients can get some pretty severe swelling, especially during the first and second treatments with these devices. So this study just came out recently in, in, in July, and this was um, uh, myself and uh, investigator Dr. Friedman in Houston. And we thought, well, if devices are really good at targeting redness and we have some really good topical device therapies, why, why not combine the two? What are the advantages of combining the two? Well, first of all, they work by a different mechanism. And one thing you've seen today consistently, the theme is that if you can hit something with several different mechanisms of action, whether it be a topical that has benzoyl peroxide, topical antibiotic, and a retinoid, or whatever the case may be, think that way from the start. And you can affect the difference. You can, have a, you can make a bigger difference. So in these patients, we said, well, let's treat them with the vascular laser. In this case, it's the pulse dial laser. But let's see if we can, and what we're trying to do is photocoagulate those vessels. What the body is trying to do is to re, revascularize those vessels or recanalize those vessels because that's where the flow is going. We don't want that. So what if we chemically um, vasoconstrict at the same time we're physically vasoconstricting or physically photocoagulating these vessels? Can it make a difference? And we found that it could. This was our study design, and again, this was recently published the second, we, we did a, 
initial study on this a couple years ago, sort of a proof of concept, and then this one was a larger study. We had two arms, and in one arm was the, uh, the PDL plus daily oxymetazoline, and then the second arm was just daily oxymetazoline alone. And we looked at endpoints being improvement at one, three, and six months in facial redness and telangiectasia as separate components. As Julie mentioned, the, the telangiectasia don't really improve all that much with these topical agents, but um, they, you do get some vasoconstriction, but it's probably not enough to change the course of these bigger vessels to shut them down. But if you combine it with the photocoagulating device, like the PDL, it's conceivable you could get these to shut down and stay closed better, because during that initial 24-hour period where you're trying to shut the vessel down, Anything that slows down flow, in my opinion, increases your chances of that. So what we found in the study, especially at the three-month time point, but also in the subject assessment at the six-month time point, statistically significant improvement using the combination therapy as opposed to just topical alone. So if you're doing these treatments, um, we've got great tools. We used the topical um, oxymetazoline, um, and, and it worked extremely well uh, for this. So think about that. And we apply it right after the treatment. And we put sunscreen on on top of that, and then we send them home with a prescription. The caveat of that is you don't want them having, a, if you give them the prescription at the consult, that's fine. But if they use it before, you may wash out your target. So we've had to have a couple people that we stopped it. We, we stopped the treat. we didn't do the treatment because they came in and they're like, I'm not red today. Did you use the topical? Yeah, I use it this morning. Well, we need a chromophore, so we can't do your treatment today because these agents can last for 8 to 12 hours, right? So we don't do it. Um, we have them come back. I did see a study that was done out of UC Irvine where they applied it about an hour before the laser treatment, started the contriction of the vessel, slowed down the flow a little bit, and then they found that that also was effective. So that would be an interesting study to do more clinically. And that was done with the rat-mouse model in terms of eliminating vessels and redness. Uh, with, the, with the laser. So I think that might, that might actually work. But you want them to stop it for a couple of days because that effect of the vasoconstriction can last for a couple of days. So we usually tell them don't use the topical um, oxymetazoline for three, four days prior, um, and then you can start it immediately after. So lasers are not without risk, right? I mean, if you don't know how to use them properly, you're going to get complications. So these are some telangiectasia. This is published. These are some, some scars you can see from too much energy. So in 532, for example, if you don't employ the cooling properly, or 595 for, for that matter, you will get too much bulk heating of the dermis. Remember, we don't want the skin to be affected. If that happens, you will get scarring like this. And I've seen this before. I've seen it with 1064. I've seen it with 532, where the contact cooling wasn't on the skin when the device was fired. And then you get these, little, these uh, punched out lesions that could actually be kind of hard to correct. What about IPL? Does anybody do IPL in the audience? Anybody like that? Okay, great. I think, it's, I think it's a really great device. I think you have to be well-trained or get with somebody that can train you well. You have to know to read the endpoints of IPL. You have to know not to over-treat, and you have to know when not to treat. But that can be as, as effective as pulse dye laser. Uh, there's been some really good, interesting studies showing um, duplex or Doppler evaluation showing a decrease in flow after a series of treatments. So we're shutting down these vessels. We're getting, when we do get flushing, it's less intense because there's less flow there. But a certain percentage of these patients, in my experience in, uh, in, the, in this paper, which is uh, Dr. Vic, Vic Ross was talking about IPL, he uses that a lot, don't respond. And so we do have another option. What I found very helpful is going back and forth between the two. So if they've got extensive facial erythema, I mean, really extensive, I might even opt for IPL as my first treatment because the spot size is much bigger. Uh, you can cover a lot of ground quickly. You can treat the whole face, the forehead, the cheeks, um, everything, and in, uh, I think in a much more even fashion. Um, and then you bring them back after, the, uh, after a couple weeks, four weeks or so, and then you do, you do pulse dye there, pulse dye laser. So you could mix and match these devices. Um, IPL does, it can help inflammatory lesions as well because it, you get a lot of bulk heating at these areas or you get heating um, uh, of the inflammatory areas because they're red as well, they're edematous. And so if there's follicles there, they will get heated up. If there's perifollicular phenomenon going on, they will get heated up. And I mentioned some papers on Demodex which um, show some destruction of the Demodex mite. In fact, there's one paper that suggests in patients that have a lot of pustules and have a lot of uh, heavy Demodex load that they will, they will get a worsening of their, um, 
of their uh, inflammatory lesions after a treatment or two because of the uh, the death and the the uh, the uh, burden of the the dead or dying and the the, the uh, demon X that are dead from these lesions. So you'll get a little bit of worsening before it gets better. Now, IPL operates under a different. It's not a. It's not one single wavelength, as you know. It's multiple wavelengths. And so the difference between IPL devices, and you can't really generalize one device to another. You have to take these for you know what what their hand pieces are, what their filters are, and how they work. So if I gave you settings for say one IPL device, it, chances are it's not going to work on yours if it's a different device. But in this case. Um, what they're doing is filtering out the, the wavelengths for the, only the vascular specific ones. So you can look at this graph and you can see that there's a, there's a peak at 530 to 660, which, there are, which is vascular specific for hemoglobin. And there's another peak that's beginning that's relatively higher between 900 and 1100. And that could be diode all the way up to the infrared wavelengths. Of, uh, and that is a peak for, could be for oxy or deoxyhemoglobin. So you can sort of hit these with a double peak and at the same time use multiple pulses in between to get, uh, to get vascular. So I think that's why IPL is so good. I hope this projects well, but what I want, to, want you to see is this, the, 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 the relative loss of vessels in this area where the square is. This was just one IPL treatment um, and they can do extremely well. So he didn't want to come back for a second treatment, interestingly enough, I don't, I, I don't know why, but um, when I showed him this picture, Look, look, your vessels are gone in that area we treated. We just have to treat the rest of your face. And so um, hopefully we'll come back and get that done. But that's the power of IPL because of the larger spot size and, and deeper penetration. In the last two minutes, we're going to talk just about some results. These are all patients of mine that I've treated, and you can see some really nice improvement. This is with the pulse dye laser. And as, as Sunil said, I don't, I should, hopefully I don't have to tell you which one's the after picture because you can get a really good idea by looking. So this one has both telangiectasia and um, facial erythema and an improvement in both of those aspects with vascular lasers where you can't get that alone with the topical. And centrofacial erythema, and this is cross-polarized, so you can see the improvement uh, in her in the central face. Uh, this patient has that erythema of the nose it's, that I find so difficult to treat in the lateral cheeks in the central face, and she improved. Now, I would also argue putting these people on maintenance topicals is a must, or even maintenance orals if you feel that, say, low-dose doxycycline or is, a, is, a, is prudent. I, I would absolutely do all those things. So you can't, uh, can't eat a meal with just a knife, last I checked. Here's, the, um, here's a really impressive improvement in theme on the lateral cheek. This is one of our, our most schedulers in my office that hopefully keeps my most schedule full, but you can see a really nice improvement. She tried a lot of different topicals and got a really nice improvement, and we did that staggered IPL PDL treatment. I'll leave you with that not all the glitters is gold, so uh, let's see if I can find. This patient actually ended up having an overlap of subderm and rosacea, and she had redness from both. And so when we recognized this and we treated her with subderm uh, topicals, she finally got better, and she had been through a whole host of treatments. This patient had um, polycythemia vera. We didn't know it at the time. <laughs> we treated him and treated him and treated him, and he didn't get better and didn't get better, and I felt so bad. And then what ended up happening is he went for some blood work. This, they tried to stick him with blood. The, 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 the blood kept coagulating in the tube. Um, you, you, know, you get further history. Oh, it's just in the shower. Wait a minute. So ended up he had polycythemia vera. So once they started doing phlebotomy, then his redness got better. So despite all I did. And this was another patient. So I learned this is another patient two years later with the same thing that happened. So I said, let's skip the laser and let's go straight to the evaluation. So I'm going to end right there. And thank you very much for your attention. It's great to be back here again. And thanks, Joe, for having me.